2023 has come to an end, and it's been a year and a half since the last Silksong content update. So before the fateful day comes, the Daily Silksong news channel has a glorious green yes in the thumbnail, and it isn't a delay announcement or metadata from a four-year-old trailer, I thought we'd better bring everything we do know together into one place. I've enjoyed clowning around as much as the rest of you, but I think we're all feeling the fatigue of a game announced a bit too early. But I have to say that looking through everything we've had so far really reignited the fire for Silk Song in me, and I'm happy to let Team Cherry cook. In the meantime, we'll go over all the gory details, from NPCs to enemies to equipment, starting with story. Our tale begins with Hornet, seized and sequestered, escorted through the howling wastes between kingdoms by ominous religious figures, the seal of binding on her cage draining the strength from her body. An unassuming glowing bug flutters down and shatters the seal, giving her the opportunity to break free and fall to the depths of this mysterious kingdom of Farloom. Probably should have thought that one through, Hornet. Unlike the knight who had to arrive at the top of Hallow Nest and descend into it, Hornet finds herself at the bottom of Farloom and has to reach its peak where a religious citadel stands as the monument to the culture of Farloom and its people. There's a curse affecting many of the denizens of Farloom, which appears in the form of silken marionette strings. Hornet's familial connection to the weavers and their presence here in Farloom pushes her to discover their secrets to regain her former strength. But this is a story of silk and song. Music has power in Farloom. Loom. And although we don't yet know just what that means, the importance of music is clear in the design of this new world and its characters. Bells especially are strewn about different world spaces that can all be interacted with, and enemies are seen wearing or using musical instruments. We even see Hornet playing along with a cast of colorful new characters for our heroine to meet and interact with. And unlike the knight from the first game, Hornet has her own voice, allowing her to interact with and shape the world around her. She won't be afraid to speak her mind to the bugs she meets. Like the church keeper, for example, who's seen possibly subduing Hornet a short time after escaping from her gilded cage, but later seen as an ally. Perhaps the first NPC to introduce Hornet to where she is in the mysteries and hardships surrounding Farloom. And even how to jam. This active kingdom is bursting with life, unlike Hallow Nest, and we've already seen a host of characters whom Hornet will get to know over the course of the game. Forge Daughter is the hardy bug that will help Hornet build the tools she uses to eviscerate other bugs. In her speech, Forge Daughter refers to herself in the royal we. She might have some connection to the royalty of Farloom, or maybe she's just an eccentric weirdo. I'm okay with either. Allo is Forge Daughter's trusty helper. The dialogue between Hornet and Forge Daughter seems to suggest that the two of them are the only ones in the Deep Docks that still have a sense of themselves. And Forge Daughter gets a hearty chuckle out of you literally ringing Balo's bell. Me too, Forge Daughter. Me too. Hornet will also encounter Sherma, a small pilgrim on a spiritual journey through Farloom. He'll be able to help lead Hornet on her path to the top of Farloom whenever they cross paths. Though, he can't fight for shit. Grindle is a snitch bug that Hornet releases from captivity who'll sell her information for the currency of Farloom, rosaries. I already love Garmin and Zaza. Even from the short snippets we've seen of most of these characters, they're already oozing with so much innate personality. This goofy duo will aid Hornet in battle on some quests, something we'll talk about a little bit more later. And this charming Don Quixote-esque knight is already being razzed by his own creators. Team Cherry literally says, but Zaza could be the real brains of the pair in one of their blog posts. Get wrecked, my mustachioed friend. And the caravan is the Grubfather alternate in Farloom. These fellow wanderers are vaguely in search of something precious, or as they put it, a humble wish. While Hornet explores Farloom, she'll come across young fleas to rescue, who will make their way back safely to the caravan. If we don't get some kind of flea circus bit at the end of finding them all, I'll be honest. I'll cry. And there are a few yet unnamed NPCs to come across, like this moss druid, a tribal hunter-looking guy, possibly disguising themselves as an ant for protection, and this hermit-looking fellow who's wearing a shell made of poo? Like a hermit crab? I don't... Ugh. More like a hemorrhoid crab, am I right? Not to mention the plethora of other denizens scattered throughout the towns of Farloom that really make this kingdom feel more alive. We also have some NPCs that make it unclear at times if they're friend or foe. Huntress asks for the insides of Hornet's warm shell as a feast for her brood. Going by her name, it seems possible that she could act as an alternative to the hunter in Hollow Knight, providing information on enemies in-game. Chakra takes Cornifer's place as the game's cartographer, although unlike him, she's a power 
powerful warrior, and instead of following a paper trail to find her, we'll follow the remnants of the Chakram from her battles. In the Edge magazine interview, we get a glimpse at just how much Team Cherry cares about all the small details in the game as Ari gets giddy of the stray Chakram bouncing, rolling around, and toppling when you hit them with your needle. Although she's an important ally, Chakram may also be an opponent at some point in the game as she searches for her lost master. The Bell Beast is a foe turned friend. When you first meet her, she'll be caught in a cocoon of silk and lash out once freed after an indefinite amount of time contained. But she'll later act as a transport in Farloom through the Marrow, which is just the perfect name for a transit system that moves through the bones of a kingdom. There are more NPCs that will act more like rivals and antagonists than allies, so we'll talk about them as we get into combat. But let's start with quests, many of which you might find through these very NPCs. Silksong is expanding upon the stumbling upon stuff approach of its predecessor. You'll be able to come across quest boards in the towns of Farloom that are filled with requests from NPCs. In some footage, we can see gathering quests, hunting quests, and wayfaring quests. There seem to be different difficulty symbols as well, which we can see with the hunt and grand hunt, so you'll have an idea of what you're strong enough to tackle. Now, before you get worried that Silksong is going to turn into a modern, open-world mess with bullshit fetch quests up to your armpits, Team Cherry has made sure to point out that these are in addition to the organic, unfolding quests from the first game. These are additional ways to prompt you to explore the world and aid NPCs while undoubtedly getting some small rewards along the way. The guides for these quests are also quite vague. This gather quest from the Druid of Moss Temple is simply titled Mossberry Brew, with a short, somewhat nonsensical note from the druid mentioning fruit. So you have an idea of what you're looking for, but not where to find it or how to get it. In an early blog post, Ari and William also mentioned a Silk Soul game mode similar to the permadeath of Steel Soul, but a step further with extra challenge. But they're scant on further details. Alright, combat baby, let's go! Fast-paced, reaction-based combat is the name of the game in Silk Song. Hornet has a much more acrobatic moveset and suite of abilities than the Night had. Falling lunges that throw you back into the air, flips, nail tethers, dashes, parries, faster heals, special attacks, tools. I'm not even sure how Team Cherry is going to fit all of these buttons onto a controller. Not to mention that you can interact more with some enemy attacks, and her mobility will make weaving in and out of them much easier. To combat Hornet's extended arsenal, enemies are smarter and have more at their disposal. Even basic enemies like these bellheads have spots on them that you can't damage with your needle, so you have to think more about how you approach a variety of enemies. You're no longer facing a mere of mindless husks that just walk at you and swipe. And she can run. Oh god, can she run. And backpedal, and dash around quickly. The ability to move changes the game so much as you sculpt your approach around a group of enemies or a boss. And it looks like the run can transition to a dash attack that launches you into the air. Dash pogo attack is looking like her bread and butter combo. The range of special attacks is also somewhat unclear. These all seem to use silk that you fill up in the same way the knight gained soul. Personally, I'd say her silk is made of soul, but but that's a topic for another video. We've seen Gossamer Storm, a large silk spear, a dash, this needle grapple, and maybe a downwards arcing attack? I can't help but wonder if these are all the options or if Team Cherry is still hiding a few special attacks from us. And if we gain them all over time or if they can be swapped out like tools. We could speculate all day, but let's break down Hornet's arsenal. First, mask shards make a return in Silk Song as a way to upgrade your health. Four shards for a single mask. Although just how many we can find, we'll have to wait and see. Shell shards and rosaries are the currency of the realm. She'll lose any loose rosaries on death, but you can get them strung up on rosary strings to avoid that. And shell shards always stay with you. Like the knight's soul meter, hornet's silk spool breaks on death and is repaired by finding and destroying a cocoon that is left behind where she last died. Crests are where Hornet just begins to really separate herself from the knight. We don't know how we'll acquire different crests yet, or if they'll be upgradable, but they allow you to equip certain tools and change Hornet's moveset. And if I blame anything for Silk Song's delay, this is one of the big contenders. We know of at least four different crests besides Hornet's default state, and it's fairly safe to assume that there will be more in the final game, and they all change Hornet's animations. That's so many drawings, people. I don't think you understand just how huge huge this is compared to the knight's very basic attacks. We've only really seen two in action so far. This claw-shaped crest seems to transform Hornet's aerial lunge into a Sonic the Hedgehog spin dash, and gives this jagged effect to some of Hornet's special and regular attack animations. Then this spiky-looking crest is the Reaper crest, and it seems to give an extra sharp edge to animations, and turns Hornet's dash attack into a rising uppercut. It's worth noting that both of these crests affect needle attacks and also have the nail extend up five masks across Hornet's health bar, possibly signifying increased 
melee damage with them equipped, or simply the level of her big dick energy. Compare that to the default state that only extends to the third mask, or this other crest that is just past the second mask. Whether this will change as crests are possibly upgraded is unclear, but the HUD is clearly showing a lot more information than it used to. My one concern with crests is that the ones you find later in the game will be significantly better than the earlier ones. You can see comparing the default Wanderer and Reaper crests that the Reaper can hold significantly more tools, and the center is either a special move slot or more likely signifies the changes it makes to Hornet's attacks and abilities. If crests can be upgraded to the same levels, then they can all be balanced against one another. But it might be that a handful of crests will be significantly more powerful than the rest. We've seen two other crests. The first is this one with a curved design that extends into a harp shape, possibly signifying that it enhances how Hornet uses silk. And we can see how crests also change the way you store silk on your spool. There's a center notch on some spools signifying when you can heal as well as additional space to fill and use abilities. It's possible that different levels of healing thresholds might take different amounts of time to complete and or change the number of masks that binding recovers. Finally, we have this razor blade one with an arch over top. We don't see this crest in action, but the length of the nail suggests this is more of a balanced crest since the melee crests have sharper details and a longer nail. But the silk focused crest is more rounded with a much shorter nail. This is speculation, obviously, but I'm very much looking forward to trying them all. Let's talk specifically about tools now. Forge Daughter seems to be the character that will help Hornet hone and expand her arsenal, and many of the tools or modifications on attacks she gets we see other enemies and bosses perform. There are red activation tools as well as blue and yellow tools that all fit differently into certain crests. Although we don't yet know what the blue and yellow tools do. We'll likely use the rosary currency dropped by some enemies in part to pay Forge Daughter for her crafting skills. Although her dialogue suggests you may need other materials as well. And shell shards that are dropped by most, if not all, enemies are used to replace replenish spent tools at benches. Let's start with the red tools that appear to be all activatables. Not all of those have names yet, so it might get weird. The straight pin is the tool that we've seen the most footage of, a very basic speedy projectile, but the edge magazine issue confirms that some tools can be upgraded or modified. We don't know if there's only one upgrade path for each tool or if there will be branching options. Probably the former because that would be too insane. And in this case, the straight pin upgrades to the tri pin, firing three pins at once like a sharp edged primal aspid. Great for hitting multiple enemies at a distance or possibly getting three hits in for the price of one at close range. We have two images of Caltrop looking tools that likely have the same upgrade path is the tri-pin. We only have video of the multi-caltrop in action, but it seems clear that they'll deal damage both when thrown and once they're on the ground. Though we don't know how long they'll persist, or what their damage numbers will look like, and I can only assume the final upgrade for the tool will be a handful of Lego. The third potential upgrade we can see is with the pin pillow. This unassuming little ball explodes, dealing a ton of damage to multiple enemies. This other image looks very similar to the pin pillow, so it could either be an earlier weak version, or a bomb with some modified damage type. The patchwork look kind of says poison gas to me, but it could also be a totally separate tool. I'm curious if these upgrade paths will be quite linear with clear front runners for strength, or if the single pin of the straight pin could still be a higher damage option compared to the multi-hitting tri-pin. Now there's a variety of tools we see in action, as well as some that we don't. Starting with what we do see, we have the Sting Shards. You should be familiar with this one from the first game. It seems she can set these up anywhere, and they really stab out when an enemy comes close. Not to mention that Hornet can use them for platforming. The Cogfly is cute, but we don't really know what they actually do. They look similar to some in-game enemies, but do they damage enemies? How do they do so? All we really know is that they'll for sure be a part of future pet builds. We're more into unofficial names now, but I'm going to call this one the Cloak Drill. It gives me grim vibes for some reason, despite him never turning into a drill, but Hornet's cloak turns into a vertical weapon for a few seconds before she launches back into the air. The acrobatic variability for combat in this game is going to be wild. Way more airborne and dynamic than Hollow Knight ever was. Keeping on the drill theme, we have this corkscrew that acts as a throwing weapon that then bounces around the arena, dealing damage to anything it touches. Having tools for specific situations is going to be be huge. This would be especially deadly in any tight arenas with more opportunity to bounce around, and it seems clearly inspired by this boss enemy. I can't help but wonder if Hornet will pick something up from the boss that allows her to bring it to Forge Daughter, or if she'll bring just the idea itself to her. We only have this one still of the hairpin harpoon in action, although I think Hornet needs to check her aim. It's unclear if this would have any additional benefits as a thrown weapon to separate it from the straight pin. Maybe it's slower for more damage or can skewer multiple enemies. The saw blade looks especially deadly. It takes a moment to fully activate, but then it runs down multiple enemies. It seems like this could do insane amounts of damage to bosses if you can time it for the right opportunity. We'll take a quick break from all these offensive tools to talk about the Lifeblood Syringe. A quick activation gives you two Lifeblood masks, and I can't even begin to describe just how much better this is than any of the Lifeblood charms. Two masks at any 
time with multiple activations. This is basically just an extra heal that doesn't require silk. It's actually insane. I really like that not all of these red tools are just damage. There's a clear range of use cases that all fall under this activation category. Like this tool that I'm hesitantly calling the copper spool. In both the shots that the spool is equipped, we can see the end of Hornet's silk spool has a copper finish instead of the normal iron one. I really have to thank Rusty's trailer breakdown video for spotting this because I didn't notice it at first. Originally I thought this looked like some kind of orange drink, but it also looks like it would be some kind of thread spool which supports this copper addition, extending the silk spool slightly. Although since this is an activatable tool, it must have some reason to be activated more than once between bench rests, so whether the extension falls off after some amount of time or number of uses is unclear. Maybe when first activated it also grants you that much silk. Back to the more offensive tools, we see this bone boomerang in a few different shots. I think we can all imagine how a boomerang might function, but apparently hitting it after it's been thrown can change its trajectory. Ari says there are many sub-reactions programmed into different weapons to keep them interesting and give that extra bit of mastery. I just... I just love the idea of tool options with very high skill ceilings. These next few we haven't actually seen in action so we can only make predictions. These spiky whatever they are could be some kind of boomerang upgrade, but I also think they look like some of the weapons that ant colony enemies wield, so they could be some kind of alternate melee weapon as well. I have to imagine that not every tool needs to be a ranged attack. These ant claws could either deal extra damage or maybe break through certain enemy defenses like shields or the bell heads. Then we have this one that's a little less clear. It looks a bit like the exploding smoke rock in Deep Docks but if you actually compare it to the cloak drill, they have this similar shape language and this saber-like hilt and handle at the top. So this could be an upgrade to that tool that adds some sort of explosive quality to it, but it could be not that at all and totally its own thing that somehow differs from the Pimpolo. This one, I've got no idea. My first thought is that it looks like a Star Wars speeder, but that just can't be true. It could be some kind of big weapon, a missile maybe, or some defensive ability like an oddly shaped shield. If you have any actual good ideas for this one, let me know. We'll move on to the blue tools we've seen in menus. These ones are pure speculation. They don't appear on the HUD in any obvious way if we've seen any images of Hornet with them equipped, so it's possible these are more passive abilities. We have this green blob looking tool. The Hollow Knight wiki says it could have something to do with acid since it resembles Isma's tear, which is possible, but it also looks kind of like the moss berries we've seen in Silk Song. We don't know what exactly moss berries do or what they're for, but it's very possible you get this from helping the moss druid. Could improve speed, silk generation, acid attacks? who can say. This next one looks like it follows the same design as the last one, so it could be part of its upgrade path, or it does something totally different but related in theme. Where better to put silk upgrades than in these passive tools? This weaver grabber says to me that it helps increase silk generation you grab from hitting enemies like Soul Catcher and Soul Eater. But like the last tool, it could do almost anything, but almost assuredly something to do with silk. This one says Spider Spindle to me, probably another silk-based tool, maybe increasing the length of special attacks that consume silk, or adding more charge to the silk spool. This purple carapace tool reminds me of Baldur's Shell. Baldur's Shell? Clearly a defensive charm of some kind, but does it protect you while binding? Some kind of parry improvement? I mean, we could go all day on this stuff. The next tool feels like it shares design elements with the last judge. So it could have something to do with fire and smoke, a smoke screen of incense when you get hit, or maybe an on-hit effect for some attacks. Something's there for sure. This one looks like a Beyblade launcher? A spinning top tool would actually be cool, but this is a blue tool, so who knows? Maybe some kind of improvement to other tools? I do wonder where we'll see synergies between crests and tools like we got for some charm combinations. Now we have the yellow tools. We only get a partial glimpse of a few. The symbol looks kind of like a compass, so it's possible that these are also passive tools but don't have an impact on combat and mechanics in the same way as the blue tools. This one on the left looks like it could be a map compass for getting around Farloom. The other two are a little too hard to see. Finally, we have two tools that we can't be sure where they fall. The circle of barbed wire is seen equipped on the Reaper Crest, but it isn't in the section of the blue or red tools. It could be yellow, or it could be a whole other category we don't even know about. Regardless, it's likely tied to this HUD effect of barbs appearing around Hornet's masks, which probably has a revenge effect like the Thorns of Agony charm from the first game, although hopefully a little better this time. We don't see what the final tool looks like, but you can see Hornet's first mask has a different look to it. It's possible that this works as extra protection for Hornet's last mask so you can take an extra hit or two while trying to build up a healing bind. And that's all the tools we've seen or know about. There may be even more in the final game, and many of these likely 
probably have some level of upgrade path, but tools aren't any good without something to use them on. Enter all the bosses of Silk Song. We've seen quite a few already in trailers and other promotional images, and they might be the most exciting part. Let's start with our hardy rival Lace. Much like Chakra in the Bell Beast, she appears to act as both an enemy boss and an NPC, but is more on the side of an antagonist. She works with a group trying to prevent Hornet's ascent to the Citadel, but when we meet her in the Deep Dock, she's conducting a number of small glowing bugs like the one we see undo the seal on Hornet's cage in the opening of the game. Does that mean she's working against the cultists of the Citadel, while also being Hornet's enemy? There are clearly multiple factions at work here in Farloom, but well, let's talk about battle mechanics. We see a full version of this fight in the Nintendo Treehouse event from way back in E3 2019, and it really feels like it sets the tone for the whole game. Lace is quick and nimble, much like Hornet. Her attacks come out with almost no frames of lead up, and some of her lunges are really baits for attacks with her pin. She even attacks right out of a stagger, and her counter seems to deal two masks worth of damage. These fights are going to be much more high paced than anything we got in Hollow Knight. We also get a glimpse of what we can assume is her second fight, which will hopefully have some distinctions from the first, much like the Hornet 1 and 2 fights. Trubio is a flamboyant butterfly, and I can't imagine any other kind. He appears in the first Silk Song trailer in the new bosses section, but is listed as an NPC in the Silk Song press kit. Like Lace, we might find ourselves fighting and interacting with him often, and I for one couldn't be more thrilled to have even more reoccurring characters like Hornet and Quirrell were in the first game. Sad we don't see him in action, but I'm sure he'll put on quite the show. Seth is a deadly sentinel, guarding some secret at the base of the Citadel at the behest of an unknown entity he calls the Voice. Like Lace, he wields the traditional weapon of Farloom, a pin, but pairs it with a symbol for a shield. He has strength and speed beyond that of a normal bug, and can be seen in his boss fight disappearing and reappearing in the blink of an eye like an anime protagonist. Seth was created by Seth Goldman. He was diagnosed as an infant with a rare tissue cancer called Ewing sarcoma which reappeared when he was a young man. Through the Marty Lions Foundation, Seth had the chance to meet Team Cherry, and they asked him to create a character to put into the game. Sadly, he passed away soon after in 2019. He may not have gotten the chance to play the final game, but he'll live on for the rest of us to remember in this powerful character. Rest in peace, Seth. We'll see you in the dream halls of God Home. There are more bosses yet, albeit a little less somber. We catch only a short glimpse of the beautiful operatic Hunter Queen Carmelita, or Carmelitia, depending on if you go by the blog post or press kit. You may have noticed a theme here. Hornet appears to have many enemies that rival her acrobatic skill and stature. It feels like all of these characters could be rivals and foils to Hornet, which I hope leads to some incredible combative storytelling. Sharp is the last boss we've seen that falls into this category. He's one of the bosses created by content backers on the Kickstarter, a lithe assassin whose nose is his weapon. And he has two mystery accomplices who, wouldn't you know it, want to kill Hornet. Shocker. Moss Mother looks to be our early boss replacement for Grez Mother. It's kind of funny how similar these two bug mamas are, although it's possible that the version we saw in the demo years ago has changed significantly. She definitely moves and attacks more aggressively than her Grezzy counterpart, but also doesn't explode into a throng of her own children, so... That's a plus. The last judge is our last named boss, and it is chaotic. Holy. From swinging his sensor around like a morning star, firing off huge pillars of flame, and rampaging around the stage. This is it right here. This is a goddamn boss fight. You'll have to master Hornet's nimble feet to conquer it. I'm sorry, I forgot all about Ass Jim. All right, this guy's community named, but he really knows how to shake what his mama gave him. Woo boy! What are you serving up there, chef? Ass souffle? We see Garmin and Zaza helping us out against this vision-impaired batfly. I'm not sure why he has blinders on, but I assume he'd just be too powerful an enemy without them. Everyone loves a multi-enemy boss fight, right? Nobody has any bad memories about Washer Knights or Radianting Oblobbles? Just me? It's likely we get the corkscrew tool from these coneheads here, so I've just been calling them the corkscrews. I assume Karen here is mad at us for stealing their kids lunch money or something. They do look like a Karen, right? There are a group of enemies we'll get into after these bosses that look like they take after this four-legged Marowak, who's been seen terrorizing towns around Farloom. He's referred to as Skull King in some trailer metadata. This armor-clad knight never misses chest day at the gym, clearly. I've taken to naming him Sir Puff on account of that puffed-out chest, but according to the trailer metadata, he might be called the Coral King, and I love this arena, holy shit. This has to be one of the coolest boss fights we've been shown. This is an 
an iron giant behemoth, possibly called the Song Golem. The closest fight the first game has to this kind of scale and arena is the fight with a radiant, so I'm really curious how Hornet will be able to interact with it as it moves between the background and foreground. Now the last entry in our boss section might not actually be a boss, but something about the staging of this quick interaction of the trailer says boss fight to me. Just the dark lighting and movement of the enemy here is beyond your average enemy encounter, I think. But I could very well be wrong. Let's move on to the basic enemies now, starting with a couple that have mild mini-boss energy. Like this puking mole bug or ceiling crab who starts off the new enemy section of the first trailer. So, not a boss. But it wouldn't surprise me if the first encounter with one kind of feels like a boss fight. Then this slithering spewing bug, possibly called the gloom beast or bitter bug, also have some nosk like vibes, but Hornet doesn't seem to be trapped in an arena with it, so also not a boss. We'll do a lightning round to finish off the rest of these enemies, and there are quite a few already. Just to preface, there are no official names for these enemies aside from loose metadata from the first trailer. Alright, let's go. First we have the Moss Grub, the Angsty Moss Teen, Bellhead, Bell Worker, Symbol Crasher, the Hedgebug, Bardoon's Sadder Cousin, the Lily Patter, Moss Deer, Pear Fly, Evil Hophip, Evil Oddish, Bone Buddy, Skull Goomba, Botfly, the Bot Aspid, the Bone Aspid, a Cogfly, maybe a slightly different Cogfly? The Bone Gome, a Snail in a Bush, Slog, Mallow, a Husk Pilgrim, Stringless Husk, Clerk, a Cult Drone, a Cultist, Bellboy, he's so proud, a Cult Paladin, Cult Sentry, this, uh, this is just a penis. Bugs with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. Bugbot 3000, and maybe one of Sharp's assassin friends? And the other mystery one. Just some harmless coral. A fucking disgusting blighter. Dust roach. Rodents of unusual size. A landing hazard. A regular cricket. Bug catcher. Morpede. You know, because gray moor and also it's kind of millipede -y. Tower husk. Lamp husk. Snips. Bell husk. Ant boy, an ant warrior, a flant, the ant berserker, a literal bird, Knives McGee over here, probation officer, bailiff, a court clerk maybe, whatever this mystery image is, and not to mention the inconsequential bugs like these moss babies and crows. Those last couple enemies were number 163, 64, and 165, and that was from 2019, four years ago? Jesus Christ. Though you can only imagine what the final number will be. Mind you, I'm sure a lot of the recent development time has been bug fixing and porting between consoles. Let's talk the land of Farloom. We've seen glimpses of quite a few locations from Silksong already, and although we have no idea just how big Farloom is going to be, the areas we've seen already look really diverse and incredible. The level of small detail I think exceeds what we got in Hollow Knight, which was already magnificent. Hollow Knight felt like it had a very clear, desaturated connection between biomes. Even the more colorful areas like Green Path still had this somber atmosphere because of the dilapidated state of Hollow Nest. But look at the rich and vibrant green of the Moss Grotto, where I assume Moss Bag was born, and the way the moss squishes under Hornet's feet as she walks. The bright orange glow of the lava in the Bone Forest and Deep Docks, the pink and cyan palette of the Coral Forest, it all looks more alive with a higher fantasy vibe. There are of course still some somber places, Greymoor with its shades of warm ash and atmospheric falling silk, the gilded halls of the Citadel, or perhaps Song City as some of the shots in the first trailer seem to be described. There are many more with a variety of ambient settings, from a gear-laden tower to the bell-filled halls of the Marrow, and this quaint town possibly known as Bellheart. If you want a better idea of what Farloom will potentially look like, Check out this video from Mossbag linked in the cards where he tries to map out the areas we've seen, as well as some more detailed tidbits on the game's lore. He is the lore bug, after all. The most important aspect for Hornet will be how she traverses these landscapes. Hornet's movement kit is substantially expanded from the knight's simple dash, wall jump, and double jump. We haven't seen a double jump for Hornet yet, but it's certainly possible. What we have seen are a standard snappy somersault dash, a silk-based dash similar to Shade Cloak, this spidery backpedal, wall jumping, clambering up ledges, this little parachute thing, a grappling needle throw, not sure if this needs to hit a wall or not, but probably? Running? I really can't stress the running enough. And many of her attacks send her back up into the air. Team Cherry isn't kidding when they say acrobatic combat, but you can also use these attacks for some platforming by using enemies or even pogoing off your own tools. The speed at which Hornet can traverse though. A running jump and dash can clear way more ground than the knight ever could. 
or at least without Crystal Dash. I think it isn't a mistake either that she has these strong horizontal movement tools, but must ascend to the Citadel. Elevators and airflows exist as ways to quickly move up and down in the world, and certainly a double jump would help Hornet with this as well. It seems like she can also easily animation cancel out of many of her movement options, so touching the edge of a ledge won't lock you into the edge grab. You can jump out immediately or sprint out of a dash. We've got no way of knowing when Silk Song will finally release. We've been saying next year for a few years running at this point. If there's one thing that I feel confident about, it's that when we do get our hands on it, it will be amazing. They're a small team making a more complicated game with a complex release by trying to hit all the platforms from the start. If you've enjoyed the music throughout the video, I'd like to thank Farloom's musician Gautier for letting me use some of their fan-made Silksong tracks and other music. Their channel is linked below, so be sure to check it out. Going through all this content has gotten me hyped back up and really excited. But patience is an annoying virtue. Remember that Hornet had all but given up on Hallow Nest. Don't give up on Silksong. They'll let us know when it's ready. Though if I had to guess, Definitely this year.